Hey guys, welcome to the Million Dollar Case Study, session number 22. Today I have on one of my good friends of mine and someone who is very smart in the Amazon space, Jeremy Bryan. Jeremy, how's it going, man? It's going great. Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for having me on. I'm really excited to be here. Absolutely. I know we have a lot of good content to cover today, and I didn't tell you this before, but actually the video you did for us through the Jungle Sticks product launch, it had like one of the highest engagement rates of all of our videos that we've ever put on YouTube. So I'm glad you're back here because it's obvious that uh, people like listening to you and that you share really valuable content. So I know we have um, some good stuff planned. How's everything going in uh, the Northeast? Good, yeah, it's summertime, it's beautiful out. Hey, it's a sunny day today, it's all is well, all is well up here. Fantastic. So guys, today's agenda, this is something that I think people need to be talking more about. I don't often see people talk about this kind of like in the Amazon space. And that's because it might be like one of like a little bit like less sexy topics. And that's like proper inventory management and forecasting. And Jeremy's going to show this throughout the presentation today, but it is extremely important on not only um, your bottom line, but also to maintain your best sellers rank and your page rank, um, your cash flow. There's a whole bunch of reasons that good inventory management is really important in our businesses, and I think it's something that um, people need to take a little bit more seriously. So with that being said, you want to go over just our agenda real quick, uh, Jeremy? Yeah, definitely, Greg. I think so. The first thing we want to talk about is why should we care? And and you covered a good amount of it there. But we'll go into you know, why do we actually care? It's not the most sexiest topic, right? And uh, you know, why do we need to take our time to actually learn about inventory management? And not only learn about it, how, how do we get good at it? Why do we do that? We're going to go over some of the basic concepts. So we'll start with the, some of the core functions of, of inventory management, and then tie in the million dollar case study example. We're going to take real numbers from the million dollar case study and then tie it into those basic concepts just to help us learn along the way. Fantastic. The, closer to the end, we'll talk about some additional tips. These are some more advanced tips, but some tips that will definitely help you grow your business faster. Pretty exciting stuff. And then we have a little treat for everyone that sticks around at the end. We have a couple free uh, giveaways, downloads, so everyone will have access to them. They are some really exciting stuff, uh, exciting templates. I guess they're exciting to me, at least, as an inventory manager. But uh, I was up, I was up late, or we were up. My team was up late this week working on those. And we're definitely excited to give them away. Fantastic! I know um, that sounds great. I'm, I'm sure everyone's really interested in the show. Um, you want to give a, a quick, just one minute bio about yourself as well? Sure. So I've been running for running Forecastly, which is forecast.ly is our domain name. I've been running that for about two years now is when we started. I was an Amazon seller before that. I've sold I sold on Amazon for roughly about 10 years. I did wholesale resale, some some of my own branded products, and then I actually represented a couple other brands on Amazon as their exclusive retailer. So as I did that for 10 years, I did it FBM, FBA, and then I actually did 100% FBA before Forecastly was born. Then I started Forecastly because we were having a lot of stockouts and the software that I had wasn't cutting it. And and that's cool. Ten years on the Amazon. Real. That's like you're like an OG man. I think it was like you and just Jeff Bezos <laughs> were like the only the first two sell on there. Times change though. You know, the core <laughs> concepts like the inventory management doesn't change, but the the marketing tactics change. So now, what's exciting what I do now is that I get to talk to sellers all day, every day, like you, Greg. Like it's it's really exciting. I've talked, I've spoken to hundreds of sellers at this point. We look at tons of different accounts. I can kind of see how they're performing, what's working, what's not. Um, it's it's really really fun what we do. Cool. Right on. With that awesome. being said, I think that's a perfect segue. Um, you want to go? I know you have some slides prepared for us. You want to go ahead and share your screen, and uh, we'll get right into the meat. Let's go ahead and get started. They are they're crushing it in terms of sales rank. They're making tons of money, and then the thing runs out of stock. Now you're in trouble, and then they don't realize it until it's too late. So it's important to focus on these things right from the beginning. It's a direct tie to profitability. That's an obvious one, right? And then also cash flow. Cash flow is the one that a lot of people forget about. So I was running a $3.5 million Amazon business and I almost ran it straight into the ground because I forgot about cash flow and how important it was. You have to be able to turn over your inventory quickly so that it keeps cash in your pocket and you can continue to grow. If you don't have cash flow, you're going to go out of business, even if you're profitable. Um, we could. We can go on and on about the businesses that have recently gone out or gone under because of cash flow. They're just not careful about where they're utilizing their cash. 
So if you combine profitability and cash flow together, you're going to make yourself a cash machine. It's your growth machine. Like you can grow really, really fast if you're smart about it. And that's where inventory management comes into play. So let's get into some of the core concepts here and feel free, like if anybody has questions, feel free to, to kind of post them so Greg can answer or, or Greg can let me know. We're going to talk about lead time. So lead time is pretty basic. Hopefully everyone's familiar with it. But for those of you that aren't, lead time, Greg, is when you place an order, in this case with Jungle Snugs, right? We're, we're placing an order with the supplier in China and it needs to be received at the door at Amazon. So actually, I shouldn't even say at the door. It's, it's received into Amazon's inventory and ready to be sold. <clears throat> so some of the things that you want to think about are payment processing time, manufacturing time, packaging time. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of different ones. It's coming across. So in this case, I think you said we're going to ship via C, right? Cool. So we're going to ship these via C. So you got to keep that in consideration. Customs, it has to go through customs. And then it has to be, it has to go on the ground to Amazon's door. And then it has to wait. You have to wait for Amazon to receive that. We'll go into that a little bit more. So these are the numbers that you gave me, Greg. And I, I want to kind of, I just want to make sure we're looking at the same thing here. So you said that the manufacturing lead time was 30 days. And then the C freight was 35 days from the day that the supplier tells you the order is ready and it's going to go out the door to the day that it gets received at Amazon. Is that right? Yep, that's correct. Awesome. So when you, with, with the first order that you spent, place with that supplier did you make sure that they stuck to that 30 day do you happen to remember like did they stick to that 30 day time they were a little bit slow um okay. realistically it was like 40 days um so th you know they always say oh next time will be quicker because uh, you know we've done it once or twice or whatever but i think that's a uh, 30 days is probably okay cool so more important like you you brought up that's good to know it's good to be honest with yourself and with with the supplier or, or with uh, with your numbers, if it's 40 days, that's okay. At least we know that it's going to be 40 days. So if right. in the future, we might want to just add 10 extra days in there and say that our lead time 75 days. We might end up with 10 extra days of inventory, but that's a pretty small number. Like 10 days in terms of inventory is a pretty small number. But it's, it's important that you, more important than the, then the supplier sticking to their number or as important is when you look back at your history, where did they fall? So if they're, if they're routinely shipping early, you might get away with cutting back that lead time a little bit. I don't really suggest against that or, or suggest that, but in, if you're coming into the busy season, which we are, and they were late on the last order, you might want to bump that up a little bit. Right. How about with the C freight was, was that pretty good with the last order? Yeah, I think that's pretty accurate for sea freight. Awesome. Cool. So with all my examples today, I use 65 days. After we, If we were doing this live, I would probably adjust that to 75 days just based upon the previous experience because 10 days isn't going to throw us off. And I'll show you later kind of why that matters. Okay, cool. I have some considerations here. Like think about the likelihood of a manufacturing delay. How reliable is this manufacturer? In in the case of Jungle Snugs, this is a brand new product. We haven't used this manufacturer before, so we can only rely on the last order. It's only been one order so far, correct? Just one. Yep. Cool. Um, just why I thought so, but I wanted to, to make sure. Yeah. So you, so we only have one order to base ourselves on, and they were pretty close ground shipping in the U S I just, I always point that out because a lot of people forget about it. Packaging and shipment prep time. So just because the jungle snug is ready, doesn't mean that it's in the package and then it's in the case when by case, I mean the UPS box or the cardboard box. Um, it's important to think about that. It's in a couple extra days. If you didn't account for that, that could be a couple extra days that you end up out that you end up out of stock at Amazon. Which, as you get cranking, we all know that's really expensive. For sure. And then customs delays. There's there's quite a few other considerations, but these are kind of the major ones. Customs delays are funny because the type of product that you have, the more <laughs> it depends. Like it, 
some products get held up in customs quite a bit. So you want to, you want to take that into consideration. Hey, I have a high likelihood of this thing getting held up for whatever reason. Let me make sure that I, uh, that I add that in. If you're using a really good freight forwarder, I know you, you've had some, some guys that help with shipping on some of the previous webinars. They're really experienced. They know what they're doing. You have a low likelihood of getting held up in customs because you know all the paperwork is going to be right. And if that's the case, you're good to go. You don't have to add any extra delay in for customs. Yeah, that's a good point, a good thing to think about, right? Because um, that often happens, especially with like the FDA products and um, other stuff like that, right? Or the, the oh, ones that are like more controlled. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Where if you're just dealing with the jungle snugs, probably a pretty low likelihood. Although, and I'm not an expert in terms of this. This is the beauty of working with an expert that's going to help you bring stuff into the country is that they realize that there are certain materials that customs likes to crack down on and you just have to be right. careful. All right. So what's, um, yeah, we have 65 days. That's the important number. This is a really, really important number to know in your business or with your product. You have to know an accurate representation of what the lead time is, because if this is wrong, everything else is wrong down the line. Safety stock. This is more advanced and a lot of people don't know this. If they attended our last webinar, they may be somewhat familiar with it, but a lot of people don't know what the term safety stock is. This is something if you want, if you don't want to have a stock out, this is something you got to become familiar with. I've learned that a lot of sellers call it a buffer. So we put buffer on there. I've even started calling it buffer, buffer stock, but the correct term is safety stock. This is really, I like to describe it as this is your insurance against a stock out. So you're trying to predict the unpredictable. We think this is how many units we're going to sell in Q4, but re in reality, all we're doing is educated guessing, but it's educated. It's how we have to educate ourselves. So we, how, how can we get better at it? but we're still guessing because you're trying to predict the unpredictable. And that's where safety stock comes into play. So we think we're going to sell, I'm going to make up a number, right? We think we're going to sell 2000 units, but we might sell 2200. So we might have sell 10% more than we thought. I'm willing to buy an extra 200 units so that I don't have a 200, I don't miss on, out on 200 sales. Um, that kind of brings us on to the next point here, which is the cash versus lost sales. And if this is your very first product and you don't have a lot of cash, then you're going to have to cut down on the safety stock a bit. If you are a more experienced seller that has a, a you've, you've built up your piggy bank a bit, right? And you don't want to miss out on, on sales, then this is where safety stock comes into play. I'm willing to invest a bit more in terms of cash into that inventory so that I can avoid stock outs. Did I lose you, Greg? No, you're still with me. I just turned off my video to make sure we're good on bandwidth. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Just want to make sure. I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. I know. I, I always scared that I'm just like talking to like an empty room, right? Like, is it just me? <laughs> crickets, crickets. No, you're good. Keep on, keep well, on I rolling. I don't see anybody. I don't see any of the questions coming in. So I don't want to, that's why I don't know if, if people can't hear me. I just want to Yeah, no sure. worries. We got you. Yeah. I'll let so you know only, about questions. Only you as a seller can make a decision in terms of cash versus lost sales. Like that is completely your discretion. Um, and you said to me, Greg, we don't really want to, we don't really want to run out of stock. So we're in cash where we have enough cash for jungle snugs to invest a decent amount into safety stock. The only thing, the thing that I can say is a lot of sellers overinvest in safety stock. Like I can't tell you the number of private label sellers that will just say, oh, well, I bring in six months worth of inventory so that I know, so that I don't have a stock out. <laughs> well, you can have two, if you could bring in two products for three months and you can make double the profit in that period of time, if you could just turn your inventory over faster, Right. A lot, a lot of people don't understand that. And it's too complicated to go into today, but it's important that you don't over invest in your inventory. Like you want to turn it over. Um, let's talk a little bit about calculating. There is... There are some very advanced ways to calculate safety stock that you cannot do in Excel. Um, and you can't 
get out of Amazon's Seller Central. So I'm not going to go into those. Like that's what software can do. Um, and that's just optimizing your inventory, right? So you have to invest less or you have to invest the right amount of safety stock. You can't do that. But what we can, what we can do is we can calculate it in two ways. We can talk about a number of extra days. So like I said before, 10 extra days of inventory in terms of lead time, it's kind of the same thing. Like, all right, I want to bring in an extra month's worth of inventory just to be safe. A month is a really long time. I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, unless you have a really long lead time. Um, or the, perf uh, the method I prefer is, well, it's kind of a combination of the two and I'll go into it in a little while, is just using a percentage extra. So, all right, we're gonna order 1800 units. We're gonna order 10% extra to be safe. So we're gonna order 1980, right? If I did my math quickly in my head, right? Yep. That's <laughs> probably the easy way. Everyone has a preferred method. I'm sure, I should say, as I talk <laughs> at the beginning, I should have said this at the beginning, there's a lot of different ways to do everything. I'm just trying to show everyone the method that I prefer if I were to do it manually. Obviously, I'm going to use, I prefer software, but if I were to do it manually or I had, a, if, if I'm just getting started, this is the way to do it. There are going to be inventory experts on the call that are going to say there's different ways to do it. Those are way too advanced for where we're at right now in, in this webinar. Um, so let's talk about jungle, jungle snugs, Greg. Let's do it. Uh, there's two different. We don't want to run out of stock, Jeremy. Make sure of it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we can do our best, but hey, we, like I said right. before, we're just educated guessing, right? So there's two things that we, that are, are important when we're thinking about safety stock when it comes to jungle snugs. There's actually three things. Um, number one, we have a long lead time, 65 days, because we're shipping via sea. If you're shipping via air, you can use less safety stock. So that's it's one of the beauties of air versus C. Um, you haven't been selling it a long time. So you're taking a risk uh, by having a long lead time and using C. Uh, so that contributes to your safety stock, but it also contributes to having limited sales data. Like you've only been selling this pro these products a couple months now. So you don't really know, like anything could happen now in the next couple months. This thing could go through the roof and you're going to have to place an emergency order. Um, that contributes to safety stock. All of these things are contributing to more safety stock. It's, uh, it's basically me saying we might want to invest more in this product because it looks like it's trending in the right direction and I don't want to run out of stock. Um, and then there was a last piece that I didn't put here. And that's just that we've only ordered this product once from this supplier. So even if you have an existing product and you're switching suppliers, this is for the more advanced sellers that have, have sell, um, quite a few products probably, and they've, they're taking a risk by switching the supplier for whatever reason, probably cost reduction. You got to think you have to factor that into your safety stock. Like I haven't worked with these folks before. I don't have a relationship with them yet there's a high likelihood that this thing could take longer than expected for whatever reason. You don't know, it's not just manufacturing time. You don't know how they're gonna package that product. So you could have problems when it gets to Amazon's door. You could have, if they didn't do the labeling right or the, um, the customs paperwork right on the boxes, the actual shipping boxes, could have problems getting through customs. There's a whole slew of reasons, but those are kind of the main ones. Did I lose you on safety stock, Greg? Any questions there? Um, no, I think that's good. It makes sense to me. I think you did a good job uh, explaining it. So all good. Cool. So this is this one's easy. Well, it's easy in terms of it's it's easy in terms of just looking at it here. It's sales velocity. Um, everyone should hopefully be familiar with this. Sales velocity is simply the number we call some some folks call it rate like or the number of units that you're selling per day. So we have some, some data here. In the past 60 days, the Jungle Snugs have been selling 7.23 per day. And I was able to easily get this number because I'm using Forecastly. Um, you could do it manually kind of using Amazon's data. 
uh, if you were to download all the inventory reports. The reason why I say it's hard to get is this. I'm looking at the past 60 days and you were out of stock for eight of those days. Um, you were out of stock because it was a new product, just so you know. It's not like you actually had a stock out. It was out of stock at the beginning. So we're, we're looking at a different number uh, than just than just 60 days of sales. Um, that's the reason why it's a little bit harder to calculate is because if you do have a stock out, you have to factor out all the days that you were out of stock because there was still demand, but there was still demand for the product, but you didn't have any stock to sell. So they probably bought one of your competitor's product, that products, those customers are gone. You're never going to get them back. Gotcha. Um, so we have to factor that in. And then when I was looking at the most the past 30 days, it was at 9.8 per day, which is awesome. That means that all the stuff that you've been doing today is working because we're trending in the right direction. And actually, just before we hopped on the call, I, I looked at the past 15 days and I think it's like 11.5 or 11.2 per day, which is great. Like it's definitely going in the right direction. And that's just for the white color, right? Yeah. Oh, sorry. You chose one of the variations. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. I just picked white for for all cool. of our yeah, just for example purposes. purposes. And I guess that's a good thing to note too, right? That um, we need to be thinking about each of our SKUs individually uh, when we're restocking, right? Most definitely, yeah. And the the other thing is is that you're gonna you could potentially have different lead times for each product. In this case, it's just different colors, so the lead time is going to be all exactly the same, but the safety stock may be different it should be different. And that is, it's a little bit harder to do as the number of products that you have as your business diversifies, right? So the number of products that you have grows, it's harder to kind of keep track of, all right, this is how many units of safety stock we have for this, or this is the calculation that we used. Um, but I'll talk about, when I go into tips, I'll kind of talk about inventory segmentation a little bit. That's more advanced, but we, and we're not going to go into crazy detail, but I want people to think about that. Cool. Sounds good. Thanks, thanks for bringing it up. Um, talk about seasonality a little bit. This one's tough. I hear a lot of people say, oh, well, my product doesn't have seasonality. Every single ASIN on Amazon has seasonality. <laughs> there isn't one that doesn't. It's, and I don't mean seasonality, and you, it could mean this. Like I'm selling, I'm selling Christmas trees or Christmas ornaments, or I'm selling Halloween decorations, or I'm selling Valentine's cards. I don't mean necessarily that kind of like heavy seasonality where it spikes way up and then it goes down to zero. That stuff's really, really hard to predict. Um, but I just mean there are certain category trends in Amazon. There are certain keyword trends, like this is when it does well during certain times of the year. Um, and then Amazon as a whole, Prime Day is a good example. That's seasonality. Um, it's fabricated seasonality. You know, Amazon just made that up, but it's seasonality. And you have like every single product sells better. And I shouldn't say every single, the majority of products or accounts out there will go up on Prime Day, even if they don't have a lightning deal, uh, simply because there's more traffic to the site. And we're going to talk about Google Trends because this is awesome. And then the last piece is you can't easily see the Q4 bump, unfortunately, with Google Trends. But we can account for that a little bit. So this is where the, the guessing part comes into play when we're going to do it this way versus using some software. Even this, doing it this way, I should probably mention, is more advanced than the majority of software that's out there. Um, Cool. You want to explain to us real quick what we're looking at on the graph? Just Most definitely. Yeah. This, this is really confusing if we don't, even as I would. <laughs> <laughs> so for those folks that don't know, um, I could have brought it up and I went back and forth. It's I, I believe it's trends.google.com. If you just Google the word or the phrase Google Trends, it'll come up. So what I did was I did a five-year average based on web searches. When you go to Google Trends, you'll see this. So if anybody wants to take notes. And then I did US only because, Google, because Jungle Snugs is selling in the US. And I picked a keyword. Um, the keyword or the phrase that I used was baby blanket. Or no, excuse me, baby towel. You could, 
if I was doing, if I was really hardcore about this, I might look at a couple different keywords just to see how they trend. I think I looked up baby hooded towel and that some of them have data and some of them don't. So you have to be really careful about kicking, picking the keyword that you want to analyze. If yeah, for those, one, I guess like it has to have a certain amount of uh, search volume or else they just say like not available, right? You got it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And cool. even if sometimes it shows available, but it's still not enough. So you have to be really careful. I like to go relatively high level uh, because it'll have more, it's more reliable. So what I did was I looked at five years, brought it into Excel, and then I took what it does here just to explain, this is a calendar. Here's January 1st. Here's December 31st on the right. So January 1st is on the left, December 31st is on the right. So we can see our year, so we can see how sales trend or it's not sales, it's keyword searches, uh, but we can see how it trends throughout the year. This is reliable because it allows you to see how baby towel was trending. So as you can see here, around what, like week 20, it starts to spike up a little bit. There isn't a ton of seasonality at about halfway through the year, and then it drops off in Q4. This is where things get a little funky with this keyword. It, it's hard to know. This makes it more complicated for us uh, because it trends downward. So according to this, sales should start to decline within the next few weeks. Decline slowly, They're not, not necessarily a lot. Um, and this is not directly tied to the product. This is just based on the keyword. Hopefully I'm explaining this all right. This is a really, this is an advanced topic, but it's important to know you can just go to Google Trends and type in the keyword of your product and then kind of see how it trends for the US market overall. It's important to know like, all right, it gets busy in summer and then it dies down or it's a school year product. So it picks up in August and then dies down. That's, that's the core concept that you need to understand. <clears throat> you can do a lot more advanced stuff with this, but we're not going to get into that today. So here's what I, I did. I put some arrows on here and I pointed to week 30, I believe is, is where we're at right now. I pointed to week 30. That's today. So we're going to place a supplier order today, theoretically. And then I mapped out when it's going to arrive at Amazon. Uh, by the way, when I did this, I think I used a the number of weeks might not add up to the lead time. I think I used a shorter lead time because um, I wasn't sure. But yeah, anyway, no not a big example, deal. Anyway. Yeah. For the, there's some really detail-oriented people out there that pick up on these things. I want to make sure if they're adding it all up that it, that they understand why we did it that way. <laughs> gotcha. Cool. So I estimated that that's when the, the order is going to arrive at Amazon. I don't know what week that. I think it was like week 36. It's not technically important. Um, and then... The next thing that I did was think about, and this is where you and I spoke. I said, all right, if you want to last, you want to be able to last roughly through Q4 with this inventory, but you need to think about Chinese New Year, right? Chinese New Year, uh, there is at the end, we have a calendar for everybody, an Amazon seller's calendar, and I'm just kind of looking at it. Somewhere around the middle of January is when you need to have your product on that boat because all the suppliers are going to start shutting down. We said, let's place our order at the first week of December, I believe is what we came up with. <clears throat> Cause that'll allow us to bring it in sometime around the beginning of January. And then it'll actually get to us at the end of January. And then I just worked backwards. So I'll show you this in a minute. And this is where we might start to lose people a little bit, but the all of the calculations take your lead time. Don't worry about after you place your next order. So you, you're, you have to get starting to think ahead, right? When am I going to place my next order? A lot of people are only thinking about this order and they're like, hey, I'll order like three or four months. You need to think about your next order after that. You don't need to know the quantity, but you need to know when you're going to place it. And then it's easy. I just counted the number of weeks between the arrival, this order arrival at Amazon and when I'm going to place my next order. So you and I said, we're going to place the next order sometime at the beginning of January. And this thing's going to arrive. I forget, I forget the exact date. I apologize. But there's 13 weeks. I counted 13 rows 
in between this. So we need 13 weeks worth of inventory um, to last us until I can place that next PO. Did I totally lose you on there? Are you still following no, me? I'm following you. Okay. <laughs> We'll get into the nitty gritty a little bit here. This is this Good, is really what we want. Don't worry if people are are lost, they can always watch this again. This is recorded; they can come back to it, check it out. No, yeah, I highly no recommend that you watch this again. So once again, this is an average. I didn't just look at the last twelve months; I averaged out the last five years just so we can get a better idea of what the actual seasonality is. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and move forward. So now we start to do some calculations. There is a spreadsheet at the end that we're going to let, allow everyone to download that will have a lot of these calculations in it. You want to think about the reorder point um, because there's impor an important concept that we didn't get into here. It's not just the most important piece of inventory management or inventory replenishment is not the number of units that you're replenishing. It's when. <laughs> Um, that is, I can't tell you the number of people that we see out there on different forums that are like, oh, well, I used Amazon's tool or I used a spreadsheet and I came up with the same number as Forecastly. That's the easy part. <laughs> um, so that's the hard part is to figure out exactly when you need to reorder. And I think that's where we might've missed the ball a little bit, unfortunately. Um, so right now you have 537 units in stock. You have zero inbound, and we need to figure out what our safety stock is. <clears throat> so before we figure out safety stock, we're going to come up with what we call a reorder point. And this is just when do we want to reorder? When, when do we want to reorder with our supplier? All right. just, I, I hate going over form. I take a breath because I hate going over formulas in a webinar because it gets, <laughs> gets a little <laughs> crazy. But this one's fairly straightforward. I think this is right. good. So we take the lead time and we multiply it by the number you sell per day. Pretty easy, right? Like how many am I going to sell during my lead time? That's when I need to reorder. So you come up with 637 in, in our case. And then we need to add the safety stock onto that because you might sell a little bit more than that. In our case, I just multiplied it by 25%. It was 25% uh, was a number that we were comfortable with. It wasn't going to completely throw us off in, in terms of breaking the bank. Um, it's not like we aren't going to invest in another product because of those extra 159 units. Um, so I took 637, which is simply the reorder point, and multiplied it by a, a factor of 0.25, and you get 159 units. And that gives us a total reorder point of 796. So for those of that don't, for those of you that didn't notice it's just 637 plus your safety stock. So we need to reorder when you hit 796 units in your current inventory. So if you compare 796 to 537, you'll notice we're a little bit behind. Um, so I did some math, right? We have 500 in the right in the middle, the second bullet down. We have 537 units in our inventory for, for jungle snugs right now for white. Um, we should have reordered at 796, and then that leaves us, I don't remember the exact number, what the, what the negative is, uh, but I divided that by the number that we sell per day, and we should have reordered this product roughly 26 days ago. Um, I say roughly because it includes, it includes safety stock. It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to have a 26-day stock out. Hopefully we don't, and I believe you already you already placed a, a reorder anyway. Um, so this I is just good... placed it like two days ago, though. I think it looks All like right. I was twenty four <laughs> days late. We had you on too late. We should have had you on a few <laughs> weeks ago. <laughs> So unfortunately, the good news is that all the marketing tactics are working. The bad news is we missed the ball. So you're almost definitely you're pretty much guaranteed to have a stock out. Um, this is where this is why it's so important to figure out when to reorder. More importantly than how many units. Um, if you ordered too few units and it was only slightly too short, you just have to place your next order a little a little earlier than planned. It's not that big of a deal. The key to all of this is figuring out when to reorder. Uh, yeah. So anyway, doesn't mean that necessarily we're going to have a 26 day stock out because we have our safety stock in there. So we definitely have some extra units to play with, not that big of a deal. 
We don't know that like, seasonality is trending down slightly. So it could sales could decline. Um, but that chart, I just thought of one important thing. This chart right here does not take into consideration that sales on Amazon pick up in Q4 as a whole. So that's as an individual seller, you won't be able to see how the site trends on, in Q4. You just, you don't have that data. Um, Jeremy, would you say it would like a little bit just because there may be more Google search volume for shoppers on Google or in your experience, would you think yeah. not at all? No, it, it will. Yeah, it takes in this to a certain account. So if we were to factor out Amazon altogether, like it might be steeper in Q4, um, but I don't expect sales to decline as significantly as this chart shows. This okay. chart shows sales to go down about 30 points, um, 20 points, somewhere around there, based upon where they're at right now. That's a lot. I, I don't expect them to go down that much, but we don't really know. We don't know given what we're, we're given what we're using right now, and we're just using plain old publicly available data. Um, but you are right. That's a good point, Greg. There are a lot of times out there when those Google Trends charts will show it going up in Q4. Um, we haven't sold this product before, so it's going to be, we don't have anything else that's in that category that's even remotely related. So it's kind of, it is really hard to tell. All right. So I didn't go too far ahead, right? All right. Quantity. So we know when we need to place an order. We should have placed it a while ago. Um, the, the calculation that I showed on the last screen, if it shows a positive number, that's good because that means, all right, I have to place an order. If it shows seven, I have to place an order in seven days. Um, makes it relative. Now you have a good idea as far as when you need to place an, a new reorder with your supplier. And then we're going to talk about the calculations. Hopefully we don't lose anybody on this part. These are... A little bit more, I don't know if I want to call them more advanced, and I took some notes just to kind of better explain it. There's an important concept to realize here is that our inventory is gone before this new reorder arrives. That makes a difference because that means we're not going to have any leftover inventory that we need to factor out, right? Um, if we had leftover inventory, say we calculated, all right, when this thing lands at, at Amazon's door, we think we're going to have 300 units left in our current inventory. We need to factor those out of the quantity that we buy, uh, but we don't need to do that here. And then I counted 13 weeks until the next order, which is kind of what I tried to explain on with the arrows before as far as how I came up with 13 weeks. Just figure out when you need to place your, re your next order and then count back until this order lands at Amazon's door. <clears throat> so in this case, I did uh, days of inventory, which is 13 weeks. So I did 13 times seven, I think, plus the lead time equals 156, right? If I do my math, sorry, I don't have a calculator in front of me. Um, and I didn't keep this part of my notes. <laughs> <laughs> That's you, close enough for the example. 13 weeks plus your lead time of 65 days should give us 156. Then you take that and you multiply it times the number you sell per day, which in our case, if my memory serves me right, was 9.8. That gives us 1,529 units. Um, but then the last piece is a lot of people forget, you got you to remember your safety stock for next time. So we added in an extra 159 units. There's a lot of numbers here. So we did. <laughs> That's close and added in our, what I believe is 159 units and comes up with 1,688. There are a lot of different ways to factor in safety stock. Some people might have a you know, favorite way. This is an e a relatively easy one and it's, it's a lot better than what most people are doing. So that's a good thing. Uh, but there's a, there are a lot of ways to do that. Did you did I did you follow on that, Greg? Do you want me to to re-explain anything? No, I think it's solid. Uh, we're even seeing in the chat box. Um, I like numbers. Numbers are my friends, and some other good comments. <laughs> so I think they're. Uh, I think we're following you. You're doing awesome. a good job explaining. Thumbs it, up no to worries. that person. Thank you. <laughs> um, cool. All right. So that's that. That's where we come up with our calculations. They are once again. Feel free. Like everyone can come back to this and watch it again. I'm a big fan. When I watch webinars, I watch them again because 
you get some good stuff. Like here's the meat. Let me watch the meat a few times and, and get a, a hang of it. Um, so we can talk, I have a few additional tips here based upon the amount of time that we have. Um, you, the, these are pretty basic, but I, it's just a reminder for folks that are out there. You always think, you always want to think about your return on investment. Like, all right, how many extra units do I have to buy? How much am I going to make on that? It's really, really important to think how much are you investing up front, not only in just your product, but if you have to pay freight, uh, freight up front, that's important too. How much are you going to make in return? Um, I look at ROI on product. That's a pretty easy calculation. Um, I love to look at ROI, especially if you have multiple products or you're analyzing new products, look at the ROI. Don't just look at profitability. How much do you have to invest up front? Um, are your C, like, do you have to invest a ton of cash because it's a really expensive product and then you only make a little bit of profit afterwards? Uh, so think about that. And then C versus air. And this is a huge, we could talk for a long time. And I think you already have spoken to some other folks about it. This is a, a tough debate. Um, I'm a big fan of air because it allows me to turn inventory faster. But once you've been selling a product for a while, then you switch it over to C because you have a more reliable sense of here's when the seasonality is, here's what my typical sale is. A lot of, and then you can, and then it'll be more profitable. Oh, I'm getting a little, did you just pull your headphones out? Yeah, you're, we still got you. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> Sorry if I'm making it's, loud noises over here. No, it's just echoing in my ear. So if we look at um, C versus air, the whole air thing is, you know, I like air because it allows me to turn inventory faster. I have to invest a smaller amount up front because I have a shorter lead time. So if I have to place an emergency order, it's pretty easy. I don't have to buy as many days worth of inventory. But then if you've been selling a product for a while, I always recommend, all right, time to switch it over to C. This is also, if you have a good person to work with on the C shipment side, which I believe you have a few, Greg, then C is a, C is a lot more appealing uh, because you have someone that can help you do that and walk you through the process. It's If, if you've ever done it by yourself, it's really complicated. <laughs> I did not like it when I was doing that. So rely on your experts. Yeah, I, I thought I didn't know you could like do it yourself. I thought you have uh, to, I think yeah. you're crazy to try. <laughs> it was a while ago. Like it's I don't mean literally do it all yourself, but like to work with I think there are different levels of folks that will do it for you. Like if you have to get it here and then they'll take it from, I don't it's, it was a long time ago for me. I'm not the expert when it comes to C shipments. That's for sure. Yeah, we'll leave that part to the experts. And then product segmentation. Once you've been selling for a while, it's important to segment your products. This is where it's like, if it's your best selling product, you need extra safety stock. And I don't just mean like the number of units. I mean, instead of using 15%, use 25% like I was kind of showing you before, as far, as far as how we calculated safety stock, use a higher number, higher multiplier when you, when you segment your products. And when I mean segment, there's actually a blog post that I've written on this. Um, it's called, I believe it's called ABC inventory or product segmentation, something like that. It's like the 80, 20 rule. What are my best selling products? Um, 80 or 20 percent of your products will produce 80 percent of the profits at the end of the day. So in the jungle snugs case, we can probably look, and it might not be exactly 80 to 20, it might be 70 30, but one product, one of those colors, is going to produce a significant chunk of the profit for the. Yeah, item. we've actually already seen that. Like the white one sells like probably 50 or 60 percent of our sales, probably 50 percent. And the blue and the pink make up the other 50%. So that'd be like the one clutch one not to run out of stock of. And um, by the same token, that looks like that's the one that we will. <laughs> you never know. We'll see what happens. Uh, product segment. So we talked about product segmentation. I'm not going to go into crazy detail, but it's important that you know that you segment out your products and know what your best sellers are and you focus on those best sellers. Uh, if you have 50 or 100 different items, start to get rid of the bottom ones. Plan ahead. Um, this is really important. A lot of people don't plan. And this is why I was trying to say, all right, think about your next order. 
Don't just think about today's order. Think about your next order. You got to plan ahead. And part of that planning is supplier communication. Uh, it's really, really important to have when you're picking your suppliers. And you already spoke about this, Greg, so I don't want to go into crazy detail. Spe pick people that are good communicators. Get back to you right away. They can, you speak the same language or, or you can at least interpret what they're saying pretty easily. I don't want to, not everybody speaks English. So I'm not going to say, oh, they have to speak English. They have to, you have to be able to communicate with them in some way, shape or form. Um, and then that's what, because then you can have a better idea as far as, is it really going to be ready on day 30 or is it going to be ready on day 40 or day 60? If they seem honest and you've worked with them as you, as you build a relationship, that becomes more reliable. And your lead time is extremely important to all of this. And then the last piece is know your assumptions. And when I say know your assumptions, and actually that's not the last one, but uh, when I say know your assumptions, it's know what we're assuming in all this. So we are assuming that your sales will continue at 9.8 sales per day. Uh, we are assuming that our safety stock calculation is right. We, the most important thing here is we're assuming that our prediction of future demand is right. And that is the key to all of it. Uh, and that's the really hard part to do when you're doing it yourself. Um, it's, it's really hard to calculate what you're actually going to sell. You don't know when you need to reorder if you don't know what you're going to sell in the future. You don't know how many units to buy if you don't know what you're going to sell in the future. It's all demand forecasting. Um, so you can get away with using Excel and doing it manually yourself until you hit a certain a certain level. Uh, and then the last kind of piece of that was value your time. So your time is like at the end of the day, we all end up in the ground. <laughs> and time, I personally believe, is like that is our most valuable resource. And you have to value your time. So if it's taking you time to bring all this stuff together, you could have been searching for a new product. You could have been doing a lot of different things. You could have been sitting on a beach enjoying the profits that you just made instead of filling out Excel reports. Um, now, maybe that's not just in terms of inventory management. This is just a general concept. Um, you could search, you could manually search Amazon for new products, or you can use a product like Jungle Scout to help you out. It's... I see time and time again, a lot of people just don't value your time and you, you can probably see it bums me out a little bit. So I want to, uh, I just want to, if I take every time opportunity to say, just, just value your time. I wanted to, um, I wanted to quickly show this product in forecastly, Greg. I was actually just going to ask you if you could do that. <laughs> cool. Yeah. We'd like to see it. This is probably a little small and there's a lot of different columns here. So I'm, and I'm not going to go into crazy detail. Um, but I'm analyzing the past 30 days. I'm going to place another order in 120 days. So we do things a little bit differently that things that Excel can't handle. Um, uh, I'm looking at, so the rate changed slightly since we did, since we calculated it yesterday or a couple of days ago, you're selling 9.9 .9 per day. You have, All right. five, you have 500 was going up, right? As before as 9.8 for the white ones. Yeah. Yeah. It's going up. All and right. if I, when I looked at 15 days, it's at 11 something. So that's, that's Sweet. great. You have, um, this is funny because, and you may, you may have already done this, but Forecastly found 16 units that weren't reconciled in your inbound shipments. That's why it's showing. So we made you some money. Nice. Um, and it's telling us that we should have ordered 21 days ago. So our, our manual calculation said 26, right? So Forecastly is telling me I could have ordered a little bit later than our, our manual calculations. And it's taking a fair level of trend into account. So it's saying you should order 1,392 units. I'm not going to go into detail. Um, the, the length of time that we're ordering, the inventory is different. There's a few things that are off. So it's not an apples to apples comparison. Um, but it is picking up on certain trends in the product that Excel or, or Amazon reports aren't going to pick up on. Um, so this is the last piece that I want to point out here that's really interesting. If it, this is a 15-day cost of a stockout. So we're predicting you're going to have a pretty long stockout, right? 
if it goes out of stock for 15 days, you're going to lose $666 worth of profit, um, which is unfortunate. It's a bummer. That would have, if we could have avoided that, that probably, I don't know how many. Yeah, that's. That's like the exact reason right there, Jeremy, that like, I think like not enough people are talking about like proper, like inventory forecasting. Right. Cause like we talk about how to squeeze like 50 bucks more a month out of PPC and like all this kind of stuff. But it's like, dang it. Like running out of a stock for 15 days cost me like almost 700 bucks, which is significant. That's a lot of money, man. It would have paid for forecasting for your whole year. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one, one single order. It went one stock out. I know. Uh -huh. Right. All those hours wasted, never mind your time. Yeah, that one stock out. But yeah, it really comes down to valuing your time. And also, you just can't do things in Excel. People have these crazy, I see all the sorts of crazy Excel spreadsheets. You just cannot do things in Excel. It, it doesn't It doesn't have the capability to do what we do. Uh, we're working on some really cool stuff that I can't talk too much about that should be launched within the next about, we'll, yeah, within about the next 30 days. Um, so I will make sure that I let you know when it's available. That is going to make it basically where you're not going to want to use Excel at all. Uh, cool. Should, yeah, I'm excited to hear about it. Just because Excel isn't accurate enough. It all comes down to demand forecasting. If you know, if you can accurately predict what you're going to sell in the future, then you can do everything else the right way. It doesn't matter how many bells and whistles and creating labels and doing fancy stuff. That doesn't matter if you don't know how many units you're going to sell in the future. Um, that's what, that's what it all comes down to. But, uh, yeah. So I just wanted to point in, that out. While you're in there, Jeremy, do you want to show us around just like, just like a two minute tour of other things that Forecastly can do? I know yeah, I kind of put you on the spot about that, but no, no problem. I wasn't planning on the cool graphs and stuff. I think this yeah. is kind of cool here this is one because of my favorites. <laughs> we can see some info about, about jungle snugs. Right. And we're just looking at the white. Here's how many units we sold in the past thir or here's the revenue in the past 30 days, number of orders, number of units. This is pretty cool. That means people are buying multiples. Um, we can look at your sales history. So this gray line is the number of units that have sold. And then the green lines in the background are the green bars. This is really confusing the first time you ever see this. The green bars that you see in the background are the number of units that you have in stock. So you can see uh, this went down and then you reordered or inventory came back in. You could have held it on the side. I don't know the specifics. It came back in. We can see it was reserved for a while and then it continued to sell, which is awesome. You avoided a stock out. There is an interesting thing in here that I was looking at earlier. And I know you've done some cool stuff with this, so there's reasons why you do it. The blue line is sales rank. The green line is the price that you're charging. So if we, you can see you raised the price recently and the sales rank is slowly starting to creep up. It'll be interesting to, uh, to see how that continues. It I could agree. Probably a test that you're running as well. I know that you have some really cool software that does price testing. So it could be affiliated with that, but it's, it's just an interesting graph to look at. I like that. Yeah, me too. That's a good one. Um, let's do this. Let's go into your inbound shipments. So I can see that these, here are my two open shipments. You have $260, $261. That's your cost. That's not what Amazon is going to reimburse you. Your ROI is at least 100% on this product. So Amazon owes us $500 on this shipment <clears throat> that wasn't reconciled. I'm not going to go into it to see all the detail uh, just because it's, it's being broadcasted, but they, that's, that's where our 16 units are coming from. Uh, so the 16 units that we picked up before that haven't been reconciled, you just made an additional, in addition to the $600 you could have avoided earlier, <laughs> there's another $500 that you'll, that we got to get for you. Yeah. And just for anyone who doesn't know or understand what he's talking about there, um, it amazes me how much stuff Amazon loses, but essentially like I sent in like whatever, a thousand units, um, 16 of those didn't make it into their, 
warehouse, wherever, you know, like I, I don't, I still don't quite understand how they lose so much stuff, but um, <laughs> I guess maybe it's just like damage or they run it's over it with big, the forklift yeah, or what. Big operation. I don't know. I can't <laughs> yeah. blame them. But they'll pay me back for those uh, 16 units. I don't know. I don't even exactly know how they c- calculate how much they reimburse me. Do you know, Jeremy? It's typically what the Amazon payout is. So if you get okay, paid, so like yeah, so once we subtracted their fees, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if you sell something for eighteen dollars and you get ten dollars from them, they're gonna, on average, they're gonna give you ten dollars a unit. Cool. Okay. So, so that's, that's what that is. It's do. telling me that um, your outstanding cost or your value of the inventory that hasn't been received is two hundred sixty-one dollars. Something I want to show you here, Greg. It's kind of cool, and, and then we'll. Inside of Forecastly, what we can do is I can simply just create a purchase order. So I can say, yep, I'm ready to go, create the purchase order. It fills it all out based upon the criteria that was selected above. Here's when we estimate it's gonna come in. This is where I would fill this out. Um, It does this automatically for you. And then you are ready to go. So you're, it's the purchase order is ready to go. I could print this out as a PDF. So I can export this as a PDF. Now you have a professional document that you can send to your supplier. Um, that makes a big difference when you're dealing with suppliers and you're the pro there. That if you have a professional PDF, it looks, it looks a lot better than just an email that says, hey, here's how many units I want to order. And then Forecastly nice. will track this all the way from the beginning until it's in transit with Amazon and then receiving at Amazon. So I didn't do this. If I were to do this to the next step, it will actually create, and this is your, I think I think this is a live account. It will actually create the shipments in Seller Central for you and then divvy it all up. So it'll give you more documents that you can send to your supplier to tell them what warehouse this is to ship it to. Oh, nice. It even creates the shipments. That's sweet. Yeah, this is a relatively new feature. We launched it a couple months ago. Uh, it's, a, it's a big time saver. So that's about it. I'm not going to go into the dashboard. Everyone loves dashboards, but dashboards don't make us money. So I'm going to avoid it. Um, <laughs> I'm sure people are going to want to tell me they want to see analytics and analytics are great, but that's not what we're here for. We need to focus on the core stuff that's going to make us money. And then the last piece for the folks that are, are still around, we have some free inventory management tools. So there's an Excel uh, template that basically does all of the math for you. It does some pretty crazy stuff that I did earlier. Uh, It does it all automatically for you for one product. And then there is also that calendar that's going to come in really, really handy. I don't know why I didn't do this for myself when I was a seller uh, to have have this calendar up. Um, I was using it. I used it nonstop when I was doing all our formulas when I was getting this ready a couple days ago. Um, So they can get that at uh, it's this is just a short link fcst.ly forward slash mdcs for a million dollar case study. <clears throat> I realized I didn't put it in here. Our our website is forecast.ly. So if you were to go to forecast.ly forward slash mdcs, that'll bring you to the same place. Sweet. I'm sure everyone appreciates those uh, freebies. Um, let's see here. If you want to pop back, uh, well, actually, let's give everyone a second to write that down in case they want to go. We do have a few questions. I know we're just about at the end of time here, but I figure we could touch on them um, real quickly. We we have multiple questions about how much do I place for my first order. I know it's a tricky thing, but do we just want to chat about that, me and you, real quick? Yeah, definitely. And I have I, – I apologize. can you share something afterwards, like in the YouTube – description yeah sure we could drop it in the description yeah okay and i i it's unfortunate because on the last webinar we did we spent a lot of time and and maybe you guys have the link to the last webinar too we spoke a lot about that first order we have an excel an excel tool that will help with that and i want to make sure that everyone gets that link i i didn't even think of it sweet yeah no worries we'll put that Um, in the um... super helpful Uh, so that first order that's a tough one right yeah I went back and forth about this for a while in terms of kind of what do you come up with? It is, right. you got to think about your MOQ. Always negotiate with the MOQ. Everything is negotiable. People just love to, people love to negotiate on price alone. And that's not the secret to negotiation. Think about all the different factors, lead time, quality of product, 
um, method of shipment, price, um, who pays the freight. There's a lot of different things that, and that those are only a few of them, but you, you definitely want to think about that when it comes into your first order. Um, the times All a big one. Points. Hey, can they speed up the ship? Can they speed up the manufacturing? Um, can they, I like to ask for a smaller MLQ only on just for the first order. And you specifically say, Hey, this is just for the first order. We've never worked with you before. We want to make sure the quality is good. You can have a lot of different reasons why, which are valid reasons. You could get a junk order that shows up with a thousand units. Um, that's your worst nightmare. And then the, can I stop sharing my screen now? Is yeah, you want? can stop sharing. We'll pop back. Let everyone see yeah. your smiling face. Sweet. Um, we have one other, oh, go ahead. Yeah, we'll we'll share that, that tool. I suggest that people watch that webinar. It's a really in-depth topic. It's hard to come up with that number, but once again, I think another key to it is that I just want to say lastly is think about the next order. So like if you only buy a hundred units and you're planning on selling 10 units a day, you're going to sell out right away. Um, so you have to think about, am I buying enough inventory? I'm assuming that this is the number I'm going to sell based upon the projections that Jungle Scout has given me. Um, if I can hit the you know, equal to this sales rank, here's what's going to happen. You have to make sure that you're buying enough inventory for that second order to come in. That's important. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, let's take let's chat about one more question, Jeremy, because I think this sure. is pretty important. I, I mentioned, saw it asked in a couple different spots. What are the um, other effects of running out of stock besides just like the loss of sales? Specifically, what I'm talking about is, you know, potential loss. And of course, your best sellers ranks going to tank potentially like your keyword um, ranking for, you know, like different keywords of yours. What are your thoughts on that? Or do you just want to discuss it real quick? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a good one. And that one is a really hard number to calculate. So you can say, all right, like when we were looking at that 15 day cost of a stock out was $666, right? That doesn't take into account the effects of the Amazon algorithm, which we will see when we have the stock out, we'll be able to look right. and see here's how long it took to get back to. So it's what we've seen is typically about two weeks, depending on how long your stock out is. Um, I am not a fan and I've seen the data. If you jack up the price to try to avoid a stock out, the Amazon algorithm is not, it, that is, no. that works in reverse because That's a good point. A piece of the Amazon algorithm, and I'm not a professional I'm, about the algorithm. Uh, it's always top secret, but it takes sales rank into consideration and sales velocity. So sure. if you slow down your sales, it doesn't realize that you're intentionally slowing your sales because you're trying to avoid a stock out. It thinks, okay. oh, people are just less interested in this product, so we aren't gonna show up. It isn't gonna show up as frequently for this keyword. Yeah, um, this is actually like a commonly like disputed topic, right? So your, so your point of view, you're a fan of just letting it go ahead and run out of stock at like kind of the normal price, the normal conversion rate. And in the long term, you think you'll be better off that way as opposed to jacking up your price, which will hurt your conversion rate and therefore your sales velocity and conversion rate and therefore uh, page rank for your yeah. search terms. Honestly, I'm a fan of accurately predicting the demand and then tying in safety stock so that doesn't happen. <laughs> but <laughs> that isn't, and not everyone, not software isn't going to be a fit for everybody, especially as they're getting started. So if you, you will have stock outs, everybody has them, they're inevitable. Even if you had the fanciest software on the market, there are, you're going to have stock outs because you're predicting unpre the unpredictable. Right. But when you have it, I am a fan of just letting it run out. I've seen it work both ways. So you never really know. No one knows. Um, but I've looked at a lot of data. <laughs> I think we analyze on a daily basis somewhere around 15 million products. I think is wow. the number I don't know exactly. So I've seen the data. Um, right. And it seems to work well if you just let it run out of stock. As hard as it is to look at when it happens, yeah. um, it, it pops back up. Once it comes back in stock, it, it pops back up faster into the algorithm. Uh, right. or, or into the rank that you were at before, I should say. Okay, cool. That makes sense. That's just cool. my opinion. Like yeah. I said, but I've we appreciate seen, a lot that. Of, seen a lot of data. I've spoken with a lot of the other software guys that have looked at the data too, and, and that's what they can say, or that's what they say. Cool. Right on. Much appreciated. 
Jeremy, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing that for Castly. I love for Castly myself. Of course, um, you now have Jungle Snugs all set up in there. So I, it's no one's fault except myself if I run out of stock. And then <laughs> all I have to do is log in there and reorder when it tells me to. So thanks for going over that. It's a good um, cause. We're, all, we're always happy to hop in too if it can help and, uh, and check it out for you. It's a good cause and, and we're happy to help. Hopefully some folks got a lot out of this. Um, Absolutely. I, I think they did the, we got nothing but positive feedback from the chat box. So much appreciated. Um, so guys, I actually have a big announcement to make as well. If you don't already know, starting next week, we're doing million dollar case study Europe edition. So this is kind of, kind of, it's, it's kind of ends part one of the million dollar case study. And what we're doing is, you know, we've, we found the jungle snugs, we launched it, we've optimized that listing. We brought in Jeremy to help us make sure we don't run out of stock of that product. But in order to get to the million dollars in sales, we really need some more products, even though we're selling, um, we're at thirty, forty thousand dollars a month now with our products combined. I'm not that patient to wait to get to a million bucks. We're gonna launch another product. So starting next week is when we're gonna start the product research with that. And we'll go over more details next week. But if you're interested in launching a product in Europe, how to find the opportunities in Europe, then um, next week's gonna be a great opportunity for you. Um, you can register if you're not already registered and you're watching this live. I would encourage you to register to make sure you get the updates. Um, looks like my face is blocking it there, but it's at junglescout.com slash million. And we're going to do it at 10 a.m. Pacific time, which is 6 o'clock p.m. in London. We're doing going to do this round a little bit earlier to make sure all of our friends uh, following along in Europe um, can catch that. But um, yeah, with that being said, Jeremy, I think we're going to wrap this up. Thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate it. I know the rest of the audience does as well. So uh, take care. Hey, thank you. Have a great day. Absolutely. Bye.